Hello and welcome to the Archimedes stage, the home of network security and free software. Um, so next up we have Michael Meeks and he'll be talking about LibreOffice software, its community and development direction. He's Linux desktop architect at SUS and a board member of the Document Foundation at LibreOffice. So put your hands together for Michael Meeks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Actually, I, I just changed company two days ago. I'm now a Calabra. Sorry, we, the hastily rebranded slides reflect that. But uh, hey, here we go. So uh, what I'm going to talk about is LibreOffice to this massive audience. Um, who's used LibreOffice? Uh, I did. OK, perfect. Who doesn't know what LibreOffice is? The next few slides tell you that uh, pr pretty simply. Let's whiz through them. Hey, it's a free office suite. So we have all of these bits. We have a word processor, like you'd imagine. And we have a spreadsheet, which is kind of cool. They all have different names, calc. Uh, we can do graphs prettily. We can do presentations, like this one. Uh, we can draw pictures. Uh, what else? Oh, there's a database uh, similar to Access, I guess, in Inspiration. We can do formulae. Um, and then we can do a whole load of things you can't see on a, a screenshot easily. So uh, we're cross-platform, Windows, Mac, and Linux. Uh, and we have Android and iOS versions in development. Uh, we load and save documents in Microsoft formats, so you can load those and save them again and exchange them with your friends, and loads of other random proprietary formats uh, that we're getting rid of. So, uh, yeah. Loads of companies are involved with LibreOffice. Uh, lots of them support us, as you see there, AMD and Intel from chip industry, uh, Google, the Free Software Foundation, lots of sort of free software-y people, uh, Red Hat and SUSE from distributions, and Calabra and Lenido sort of consulting and uh, doing support around LibreOffice. And these guys advise uh, the project. They have actually no formal control. The control is by the members who, uh, who are uh, elected to uh, you know, uh, try and oversee the project uh, by, by people who contribute code, individuals. But we like to listen to what companies have to say and uh, present where we're going to them and get advice. And so we have a board like that. So I'd like to talk a bit about getting involved in development. Who programs here? Who, who can program? I can program. Aha, perfect. Look at this, you know. Excellent. Excellent indeed. So um, LibreOffice used to be very hard to get involved with. It used to be hard to build, hard to program on, and so on. It's now, well, as Carl Fogel says, it's ridiculously easy to build. It just works out of the box. This is a sort of a luminary of the free software movement, uh, writing about how to, uh, how to produce open source software. So, uh, you know, we love people to get involved. We try and make it easy. There's a whole load of easy hacks, which you can see here, um, which are easy ways to get involved with the project and uh, easy, easy to get started. Even simple stuff. You don't actually need programming skill in many of these cases. Fixing and cleaning up the code is, uh, in some sense, an aesthetic pursuit as well. So, yeah, it would be great to get uh, code contributions from anyone. And making it easy pays off. We have more and more people contributing code. This is a breakdown by corporation. And yeah, I mean, we have an extremely diverse contributor base. The, the blue stuff are people that never contributed to the project before we started. So we started in 2010, and suddenly all these people arrived and contributed every month, uh, and, and more and more as time goes on. So that's great. Uh, in recent times, we even start to have training material so you can read it and find out how the code works and how to get involved, which is great. So there's some links there. Hopefully, they're available in my uh, talk afterwards. And you can start to see the structure of the code, which has not been terribly clear uh, before. And hey, there are other fun people involved in the project. Look at them, you know, have, having fun here at our conference last year. Our next conference is in Milan in about a month. So uh, if you want to show up and meet them, uh, that would be great. So I'd like to walk through some of the new stuff we have in 4.0. Um, so 4.0 was released approximately a year ago. But hey, it's good fun anyway. So improving interoperability is a big part of what we do. And uh, it, previously, we could only uh, annotate comments on points in the text, which are not terribly useful. Um, it's much better to be able to select text. I don't know if you can see this green comment here as for a range, which is extremely useful interoperability feature. Uh, without that, we would, we would just throw the data away when we got it from Microsoft, which is bad. So, so now we're doing well with that. And that was sponsored by the Open Source Business Alliance. I hope you see this glorious Technicolor uh, picture on this side. Uh, that's how it used to look in, in 4.0. And this is the same file uh, loaded, uh, sorry, pre 4.0. This is the same file loaded in 4.0. It's quite a difference, I hope you see. So we've done a huge amount of work on RTF, uh, making that import properly. 
and sharing the code. Formulae as well, a whole load of issues there. Uh, Lanido, a consultancy that works on, on the project, has, has done some work to make e-ink uh, happen for a customer, so that imports nicely. Uh, we've done a load of work on a thing called the CMIS, the Content Management Information Services Protocol, um, which, which works with document management systems. So there's a whole load of those, you know, SAP, HANA, or IBM, Document, Foo, or uh, SharePoint is one that's, that's common. Um, we spent a whole lot of time doing Microsoft Publisher imports, so now we do, well, we have a start of that, so we can import and show people their proprietary publisher files without needing that. Oh, maybe you notice my, uh, my, uh, my, my remote control here. I don't know, can, can you see, you know, uh, as, I, as I move the, uh, let me enlarge that, uh, you know, as, as I move the slides like this, it switches, isn't that nice? Bluetooth remote. Hopefully you can even see your speaker notes and that sort of thing, it's, it's, it's dead good and getting better. So that shipped in 4.0, and that's what I'm using here. Um, all versions, actually 4.0 is something like six months ago. I'm, I'm, I'm making it up. So Visio imports, we now import all versions of Visio uh, back to the very primeval Stone Age releases, and including the new XML format uh, and doing stencils too. Um, LibreOffice has a logo interpreter. I don't know, logo, if you've ever used that thing. It's quite fun. What, one of the things we've discovered is that uh, people in schools uh, these days, they often don't teach programming, they teach IT. And IT has turned into the typing of, of today, you know? If you want to be taught typing, you go to an IT course and you come away and you can type, you know, isn't that great? Into a spreadsheet. But it, it seems to me that typing is a skill that most people can do nowadays anyway, uh, from using their, their mobile phones, their instant messengers on. And so, uh, we want to make sure that there's a programming language that actually you can learn basic skills built into the office suite so that the problem can be the solution as well. And we have some teachers' workbooks for this, making pretty patterns like these, uh, drawing stuff, uh, embedding that inside LibreOffice uh, by default so it's everywhere. So there's no excuse not to teach programming uh, to your students. And this actually meets some Hungarian uh, law around uh, teaching, teaching programming as well. So that's pretty cool. If you're Arabic, does anyone from the, the Arabic world? There was a lady from Israel earlier, which was uh, wonderful. She's speaking next. I'm sure it'll be great. But either way, uh, right to left layout is, is important. And we had a whole load of bugs and nasties in there. And the King Abdulaziz City of Science and Technology is investing uh, in fixing LibreOffice for Arabic and right to left. And so there's a lot of work uh, being done there, which is great. Other critical business uh, value that's been delivered is the ability to change you know, the top of your menu bar, so it's got a pretty picture of birds behind it. You know, we think that's very important. Uh, so, yeah, luckily to, uh, uh, actually this was actually a customer request, a customer uh, innovation that we uh, implemented for them. Uh, and as you can see, it looks, it looks pretty. So, uh, so that was 4.0. In 4.1, which was just released, so we do a release every six months, we have a number of other uh, features. One of the problems that we've often had in the past is font embedding. So when you create a beautiful document and mail it to someone else, they have different fonts on the machine. Particularly if it's a Linux machine, they don't have the Microsoft proprietary fonts on it. And so your document looks mangled and horrible. And that is bad. That is very bad. So um, again, the Open Source Business Alliance funded uh, a SUSE in this case to do the font embedding. And so you can click this little box, like it says up there, and suddenly, you know, all of this crazy stuff that someone thought would be a good idea, you know, the Joker Man font or whatever, actually works as it gets across the other end. So a very high fidelity result, um, which, is, which is a great improvement for lots of users. Um, other people uh, like to go on holiday and they, they are victims of fashion. So they buy cameras with a vast megapixel count, you know, uh, a gigapixel count, you know. The camera has a higher resolution than your average weather satellite, you know, 10 years ago. And, and it produces an image that needs, you know, like three USB keys to get it on, right? You know, so this is great. Um, and so then what they think is, well, I want to show it to other people, you know. So they then start trying to pack them into slide decks. You have hundreds of these images. And then they complain when it's not very fast. You know, I, mean, I, I don't know, what can I do? And of course, at the end of it all, it's scaled down to this one megapixel screen here, actually somewhat under sort of 700 uh, uh, kilopixel screen. And it was all pretty much a waste of CPU time, storage, and whatever else. But either way, we now make this very easy to do. So that's great. You can build slide decks of your holidays. And then you can email them to your friends to uh, stress the email system as well. So another thing that we've uh, failed to do for years is sort of embarrassingly is allowing people to rotate images in, um, in Writer. 
uh, which is particularly bad when you stick a photograph in and it's the wrong way around, you know, and you want to turn it, uh, you couldn't. And uh, that's, that's pretty silly, so we fixed that. Uh, we also, uh, this, this guy, Tomash, is just a wonderful chap. He, he, uh, he spent a while doing the EXIF stuff as well, so that it should automatically be the right way up, but you never know your luck. So we can rotate 90 degrees. It turned out that here is a brilliant example of the perfect being the enemy of the good. You know, everyone sat down and said, oh, we should rotate the image, you know, by any fractional amount and, you know, do all this complicated stuff. But then there's huge problems in terms of text layout around it and all this stuff, which is really tedious. And so, um, so no one ever did it. But it turns out to be quite easy to do. So it's done. Um, step line scatter charting. So, you know, people like to have these uh, step lines between points, and that's now all uh, working nicely. Thanks, Eric. Um, another thing that's suffered in LibreOffice is that the database component has been the unloved, uh, you know, stepchild. Unloved stepchild? I don't know that stepchildren have to be unloved, but either way, some, something like that. Uh, so it's, it's a bit of a problem, um, but luckily in recent times, several people have jumped in and started uh, fixing and improving uh, base and making it really, really a lot better. So again, Tamash, uh, Lionel are doing a great job maintaining that and improving it with more to come. Uh, we merged the sidebar from uh, the Apache version, uh, and yeah, so that has some, some pretty things you can uh, clap on the side here. It's experimental in LibreOffice because our UI team don't really know whether they want it or not, or how, how to deal with the duplication of features that we see uh, in the toolbars versus the sidebars. And we're also improving the code to make it lay out uh, much better. I guess another uh, few gallery things came along with that, which was, which was pretty nice, so pleased with that. Lots of other things you can't see. 3,000 bug fixes are hard to show you one by one. We might die uh, before we got to the end. Um, but you know, given that we have, well, I think it's actually, mm, I think it's 5,000 open bugs. It could be 15,000. I, I could be confused. But either way, we, we're pretty pleased with 3,000 uh, commits with bug fixes in them uh, in the latest release. Uh, we had GStreamer support for the latest version of GStreamer, which is great. Um, and something like 10,000 commits in the last six months from a very diverse group of people. So yeah, oh, and this, this search bar that looks a bit like uh, Firefox's search is, is much improved. So 4.1, oh yeah, so, so another random thing that we like to do, it's not incredibly useful. You're not going to rush out and immediately use it. Uh, but people that have this problem like us for doing it. So there are lots and lots of legacy document formats. Uh, Mac, Mac, Microsoft Word for Mac 5.1. You know, and they produce these, these beautiful, uh, you know, dot matrix style uh, you know, documents that we're starting to rescue and move into the world of ODF, you know, right now 4.0 and so on. Uh, actually, yeah, let's get this right. Uh, Apple Works 6, you know, some of these uh, classics of the, uh, of the software world. We can now start to rescue people's documents from those eras and make them useful and future-proof in ODF. So LibreOffice 4.1 is going to be the next release. Um, there's a whole load of new stuff in there. Um, but some of this is speculative. It hasn't been released. It's due in January. But hey, let's, let's, let's tell you what's coming up. So the first thing is VLC integration. Um, so VLC is the VideoLAN client. It's uh, a sort of self-contained media player. And it's, it's pretty awesome because it has better codec support than what's built into Windows and better than what's built into Mac. And it just ships in a single lump. A million people a day download and install it. So if it's there, we should use it because otherwise you might not be able to play your OG file or your free software formats on Windows, sadly. Um, you know, so there's a, there's a huge gap between what ships by default in Linux and what ships by default on Windows and Mac, which is, which is a shame. So WebM, for example, is, is a great format we'd like to support. And so Min has been doing a great job of integrating that, which is good. Uh, I mentioned the database work that's been going on. One of the problems with the database has been slowness. So we have this huge chunk of Java called HSQL DB. And there's a Java standalone database, but it's not terribly wonderful. And we want to uh, speed that thing up uh, massively. And so Andre Hunt has been working, actually in Cambridge uh, here, uh, writing a Firebird database backend, which is a native uh, C++ database, written originally by Borland, I believe, and open sourced as Firebird. So that's pretty cool. Uh, we've also improved our new, you know, when you load the suite and there's nothing, no document open, uh, it's nice to have a view of you know, what, uh, what documents you have had open, these thumbnails, you know, creating presentations or drawings or this kind of thing. So it's starting to look really quite nice. The UI team have been 
working away at improving that, which is good. Uh, we got this new math panel here that allows you to uh, actually preview chunks of math. Uh, so beforehand, sadly, you had to, uh, th there were a whole load of bitmaps, one for each of these things, and you would click on it and you'd get something. But now that's all dynamically rendered, and it makes it very easy uh, to change and improve and update uh, what's going on there. And yeah, have examples too, I guess, uh, which is cool. Uh, you see the Android remote, or I tried to show it to you at a great distance earlier. Uh, that's being rewritten and much improved by Artur as part of his Google Summer of Code. So, you know, much cleaner, crisper layout, much more descriptive, uh, you know, ways to help people turn on the options to make it work and so on, uh, which, which we hope is helpful. A Google Drive integration for those who store your documents on Google Docs. Uh, you, can, uh, you can upload those using CMIS, which is, which is pretty nice. And Cedric's been working on that along with this wonderful chap. I, I don't know how to pronounce his name, but he's cool. And he's done a great job, and that's just landed in master uh, for 4.2. Uh, for those of you who use a, an iOS device, probably you shouldn't. Um, you know, you should use a free software device, right? Um, the, the, the actually, you, you don't realize, I mean, it sounds glib when I say it like that. It, it's quite funny, though. I mean, so the Android remote control that I'm running here, we build daily snapshots of these. When the code changes, we upload a new snapshot every hour. And you can just go and download it onto your Android device uh, and play with it, right? Which you'd assume is how it should be, OK? Well, the problem with the iOS remote is that you can buy for some money an SDK that allows you to sign a hundred apps that are keyed to a device. So in order to get this thing, you, you have to have a custom build and send a magic key from your phone to this guy by email so that you can try the software on your phone. You know? So I mean, I, I, this is just completely lame. I mean, it's unutterably awful. And here are we trying to you know, support users who use LibreOffice, and we're even stooping to, to try and support uh, the iPhone, right? You know, we're doing something good for those guys, but actually the whole ecosystem and locked down device that you can't install anything on makes it really hard for us to help iPhone users, uh, unless we go into the App Store with a whole load of beta level daily build software, which, which would be even worse. So anyway, buy an Android phone. And uh, in the meantime, if you have an iOS, e email this guy, Siki, who's doing a fantastic job of, of writing this uh, remote for, for I iOS. We hope to have that in the App Store for 4.2, so it should be, uh, should be easy to get if you, if you are suffering uh, like that. Uh, what else can I say? Oh, he's also done a nice thing using the accelerometer. I think, I forget whether it's the accelerometer or the touch screen, so you can have a remote pointer, you know, just done using your phone, so you don't have to have a laser pointer in your pocket and a USB remote and a, you know, wander around. You, you can just you know, do it all from the same, same device. You know? so, uh, so that's nice. What else have we been doing? So um, one of the interesting things about modern hardware is that if you want to do uh, lots of graphics, uh, lots of maths on your uh, computer, one of the best ways to do that is not actually on the CPU, it's to do it on the GPU. And so if you go and you look at supercomputers doing massive nuclear bomb explosion simulation or some such, you know, they'll have tons and tons of GPUs, and they, they act very efficiently and massive, massively in parallel. And unfortunately, we haven't been able to take advantage of this in uh, our spreadsheet and uh, due to a whole load of internal structural problems. But I, I'm proud to announce, proud? I'm not really proud. I'm pleased to announce, uh, you know, that, that as of... of well, only a few weeks ago, we have uh, the first spreadsheet ever that is actually calculating some formulae on your GPU. So we've moved a whole load of you know, uh, bits of data around in memory. We've massively improved the, the internal structures, which previously like to scatter your data everywhere. And one of the problems is that uh, LibreOffice was designed um, back in the day as a demo. <clears throat> it all grew out of being a demo application for a toolkit. Uh, and no one really wanted to buy the toolkit in the end, uh, but they wanted to buy the demo apps instead, so they sold the demo apps and, and so on. But this means that the design that was laid down initially wasn't terribly wonderful, and that design tends to creep out everywhere. So one of the initial decisions in object-oriented programming is to look you know, at what's in front of you. Uh, you know, it's chess. It's lots of chess. Well, if you, if, if you look this way, anyway. And to say, well, a chair should be an object then, right? You know, the whole lot of objects in the room. The chair is the object. Let's go from there. Problem is, this turns out to be a very, very bad design decision for spreadsheets. 
really, spreadsheets have huge ranges of similar types of data for large, large spreadsheets. And so, you know, we've had to do quite a lot of work to fix the structures to make them reflect the reality. But that's pretty much done. And that's hugely reduced memory footprint, a much faster calculation, even for software calculation. Um, but now we can also use the GPU. I'd just like to show you a picture of, of, I was talking about the sort of the poisoning of the code with this concept of cell objects. So before we did this work, which AMD funded instantly, I should, should promote that. It's, uh, it's an important uh, investment from AMD. Um, everything in the code knew about cells. Everything acted in terms of cells f from everything. You know, the, the unit tests through uh, the ODF filters, through the VBA, through change tracking, undo, redo. Everything was done in terms of cells everywhere. And Kohei worked and worked and worked to this. And there's a certain amount you can do without uh, breaking anything, you know, bit by bit. But there came a point where you have to sit down and you do this, this massive chunk of work. Either way, the incremental bit was this, moving it so that just these iterators knew about cells. And then he did some kind of two-man week refactor where he couldn't actually compile at any time during the two weeks until the end and finally got rid of it all. And we're, we're really thrilled with that. So great uh, improvements in performance. Some of that is in 4.1, but none of, the, none of the wins. All of the breakage potential and none of the wins. <laughs> but uh, either way, uh, 4.1 is actually looking pretty good. So uh, yeah, so we're, we're very, very pleased to see AMD investing uh, in this way and making you know, making good use of that speeding GPU and turning, you know, multi-second calculation down to, you know, tens of milliseconds uh, in, in some cases. So exciting times for spreadsheet users. Another example of what Kohei's been up to is, uh, you know, rich text export. So, uh, you know, trying to get good performance measures for things is hard. Um, t turns out we really screwed this up uh, in, in some of these versions. But the punchline is in 4.2, we're down to, again, you know, fr fractions of a second to do some of these nasty test case documents with awkward, rich text in cells. Another problem we had, I mentioned that LibreOffice was built to sell a toolkit, a, a widget toolkit initially. The widget toolkit, sadly, was, was really very bad, uh, designed in an in a unpleasant way. And uh, sizing widgets on the screen, you know, where a widget is a button, you know, save, discard, cancel, whatever, was done manually. So all of these dialogues had to be drawn um, a, great, a great length of investment of time. And this is a real, real pain. And the theory was that, uh, you know, you can't automatically lay out a widget to look as nice as a human can lay it out manu you know, manually. The problem with this is that for every different translation, the spacing of the text changes here. And the idea that you would manually lay out 100 languages worth of dialogues, the same dialogue, particularly when there isn't actually a tool that helps you lay it out. I mean, you know, to compound the, the awful design decision, there's no, no, no graphical tool or anything that helps you draw these dialogues. You, you have to sort of know numbers in your head. So the net result is just something that looked awful. But the problem is there's a lot of that awfulness. So uh, yeah, we've been working through this. We're now about halfway through. And you can see the size of the team here redrawing the dialogues and making them beautiful. This is quite a significant effort. Um, the CAX guys are uh, Saudi Arabians who are doing a, a wonderful job here for reasons the right to left, improve right to left support. But this has a huge impact across the code base and makes everything look better, uh, we hope, in the end. So, so future things. So that's all things that are done. You know, you can, you can put your hand on them. The things I showed you about 4.2 will almost certainly ship in uh, six months' time. Well, five months now. There are a whole load of things that may well not ship in five months' time, uh, but they're quite interesting. So one of them is an Android port uh, of LibreOffice. And, I, you know, I'm a fraud talking about it. Uh, Tor it, it picture did the work. So, you know, worth pointing that out. Um, oh, and, and, you know, it's clearly very important because, well, not only is he, he drinking beer here, but, but also, you know, Android and, uh, is taking off pretty aggressively. That's Android versus Windows. You've all seen the, uh, the analysts, you know, slamming PCs as a concept. So, um, yeah. So I'll show you uh, some of these. Yeah, I'll show you them now. Why, why wait when I, can, uh, when I can make a fool of myself now? Uh, you know, why, why wait till later? So, uh, so this is, um, I don't know if you've ever seen one of these, but this is uh, an Android emulator, so you can see at the bottom, there's all sorts of buttons, and it looks, it looks a bit like an Android tablet, anyhow. A and here we can uh, look at various, uh, various documents. Let's take a Visio file. 
So we can look at this and load and hopefully render. I must point out the emulator is not incredibly fast. Um, but he here is the Visio file loaded and rendered on, on the Android tablet showing, yeah, showing a load of rubbish, you know, like a corporate slide with no meaning, you know, uh, whatsoever. Vision implication strength, you know, the, the kind of thing that people, it's called the Bool, Bool, a B O O L sheet. Um, yes, the evolution of the international not for profit multicultural social association into open world mind society. Anyway, there you go. Um, if you have a sufficiently open mind, you need to close it again on something firm. Um, anyhow, so, but a uh, nice thing, of course, is it allows us to uh, render ODF documents and to uh, do that at, you know, Good, good fidelity and, and so on on Android, which is something that people want, you know, to be free of uh, proprietary formats, of course, uh, binary formats as well are there. Aha, and it crashes, which just shows you my demo is all too real. Excellent. Uh, we like to, uh, like to keep going until it crashes. Uh, I think that's, that's probably helpful. So there's a lot of things that need doing with that. Uh, in my view, we need to be rendering pages to textures and then moving them around on the screen so we get a much higher uh, performance in terms of uh, you know zoom and pan uh, at interactive speeds, and uh, Firefox has solved a lot of these problems itself in, in, for the Firefox mobile app. So we should just reuse what they've done. They they have basically the same application design. It's one one thread. So that is the Android version. Here is the uh, the online LibreOffice online version. Uh, I'll actually I'll, I'll talk a bit about it first. So. Lots of people want a, an online version of LibreOffice. You know, they see Google Docs and they think that's what I want, and so uh, off they rush. And the problem with um, doing this is that uh, rewriting LibreOffice, which is not yet done, I mean, it's not a completely finished, uh, you know, uh, superset of all features in Office suites in the world yet. Um, but it's quite a lot of code already. It's eight million lines of code, C++ mostly. Rewriting this into JavaScript seems like it would be a lot of work. A huge amount of work. In fact, you know, you can count and guess how much work that is. And having rewritten it in JavaScript, so it supposedly runs everywhere, uh, you know, do you think eight million lines of JavaScript are going to jit and run on my phone? You know, I think you might just completely destroy the whole purpose of doing it as you do it. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm unsold on this. Rewrite everything in a type unsafe language uh, that is not very good. Ultimately, JavaScript's a bit of a joke. Um, actually. JavaScript is very useful for what it's good for, but um, you know, just consider the performance problems of, of doing a just-in-time compiler, you know, and you've got these structures with fields in them. But later on, you can add more fields to your structures. You know, I mean, any time, you can, you can whack other members in later in the day, you know, when you have thousands of these in memory uh, later. It's a bit of a disaster. Either way, so that is why um, our online office suite is basically running LibreOffice on the server and delivering pixels to the client. So we use an HTML5 canvas, that makes us buzzword compliant. I think that's very important. Uh, we use WebSockets v7, you know, which is also, also kind of cool. Um, and basically, we send very small updates to, uh, to the client. So we use compressed ping. So you know, when it's black and white text, when you're typing, it's kind of easy-ish to compress. And we send only the updates to the screen. Uh, so only small, small areas of change. So I can show you how that works. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, we, we only re-render a small amount of the screen, like, you know, in this case, this chunk of text. Um, and of that, all that's going to differ is where this IE is, or maybe where the cursor is blinking, which is all we're going to send as a compressed PNG. So relatively efficient. And we use copy area for, for scrolling, so it's relatively optimized. GTK3 provides the heavy lifting to make this work. And, you know, the JavaScript in your client is something like 3,000 lines of code, which is uncrunched, I guess. I mean, it's still clearly a prototype, and there's all sorts of problems with it. But the good news is that it gives you accurate WYSIWYG layout uh, anywhere, uh, which is pretty nice. So I'll show you, I'll show you some, of these, uh, some of these things. Have I got another slide? Ah, here's a picture of it. It's very important to have contours there, you know. So uh, yeah, let, let, me do, do, let me do some of that. Let's see if I can find it. Uh-huh. Perfect. Here we go. So um, if we're actually lucky, are we lucky? Yeah. So uh -huh. So this is pretty good. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, turn on the, oh, and you can see the browser around it, right? This is sitting inside the browser, right? It's not a, you know, 
it's not a horrible trick. It truly is a, uh, a Broadway thing. And as I type, you can see here uh, what's actually actually happening, um, which is which is kind of nice. I, I'll turn that off. Um, and you know, you can draw smiley faces, which which you know makes everyone very happy. Um, although you know, if if you've just bought uh, Microsoft Office, maybe you know you'd feel like that. You know, if if you came to my talk, you know that that hundred bucks, you know, in the whatever, it's it's a lot of money, right? So um, I'm going to try and make my uh, spreadsheet uh, work here for you. There's a particularly amusing rendering artifact there. I have no idea what it's why. Um, but it, here, here's a great example. And I used to work for Suzy. I'm going to have to change the change the logo here. Uh, but there's a little puzzle program here, and this puzzle program is written in Visual Basic, and it's it's absolutely typical of uh, you know the kind of business application that uh, that's written in in VBA. It's very very simple. It doesn't do much. You know, it's not terribly useful, but you know, the HR department requires you to file your expenses using this silly form, right? And unless it adds up, you don't get paid. So that's kind of lame. Um, and so we've done a huge amount of work on the, you know, the native clients to make VBA work and import and run straight from Microsoft documents. But can you conceive of the evilness of jitting VBA or, or interpreting VBA inside JavaScript inside a browser? You know, I mean, can, can you even begin to start to think how evil that would be, you know? Um, so, again, rewriting this stuff makes no sense. Uh, it, it's, it's really a big problem in Office Suite. It's not one of those things that, uh, you know, you wake up in the morning and, and try and write. I know, because I woke up one morning and tried to write one, and it didn't go, to, didn't go so well. Or, although I did manage to do the, uh, the Christian Union accounts in it, eventually. Um, I think I was avoiding something. I don't know uh, what it could have been. Anyhow, so that, I think, is the web office suite. What else? Oh, I can show you another awesome feature that you will not tend to see on uh, other you know, uh, office suites online. And I, I'll, I'll show you here. Look, it's, it's amazing. It's that, OK? This is a header. So the vast majority of office suites online do not do WYSIWYG layout. Actually, you know, putting a footnote in and trying to work out what footnote, what page it's going to be on, is extremely hard. Even printing something out that looks right is also extremely hard because uh, from the web you can't tell what paper size you have in the printer. So you kind of guess and you hope and you lam it, and uh, you know it's it's all just really lame. I mean, you know, there's not the fidelity of the APIs there to allow you to uh, to do this right. So it's a bit embarrassing, I think, but uh, f for the web, web world. Of course, collaboration is really important as a feature. And uh, we, we have some, uh, some work on collaboration. I, I didn't put the slides in, uh, but I'll, uh, I'll tell you a bit, maybe a bit about that. If I run out of things to say to fill the, uh, how long was it? I think I'm doing all right. Am I doing OK? Yeah? I, I, I'm getting near the end of my, my slides. Oh, I have this. Uh, let me just check. Yeah, yeah, OK. I, I'm nearly there. Perfect. So there are another couple of things I wanted to, uh, to show you. And one of those is hybrid PDFs. So we do a huge amount of work on interoperability, loads of it. It's a great chunk of what we do. Uh, and you know, we're improving very markedly there. And I hope I've shown you some of that. But still, at the end of the day, sometimes there are things that people don't see. So how can you get over that and still have an editable document? Well, there's this really nice feature built into LibreOffice that will make a hybrid PDF, which has not just a PDF, but it has the ODF document, the native file format embedded inside it. So if you have LibreOffice, you can, you can use it and get an editable document. And if you don't, you just see the PDF. But it, then at least it's viewable at full fidelity. Of course, in addition to that, we actually allow editing of PDFs as well. So you, you, know, you can import a PDF, edit it, and save it. But that's, that's separate functionality. So let me try and show you that. Uh, let's create a text document and say, uh, you know, this sort of thing, and then, um, you know, oh, instantly, if you, if you type in LibreOffice and you go, you know, this uh, is bold, it makes it bold. Isn't that nice? Did you see the asterisk foo, you know, foo, like this? It's not bold, you know, uh, so that's kind of nice. I think, um, I don't know if underline, ah, you know, underline even works today, which is kind of nice, too. I, if you're used to typing a lot, I do a lot of typing, so uh, and I don't like clicking buttons. So let me save this somewhere. Um, and actually, no, I'm going to save. So well, let's export it as a PDF. And there's a magic button which should probably be checked by default here called embed open document file, right? So we can export this and call it uh, the imaginatively named foo.pdf. Um, and then we can view it in a PDF viewer. So here we have a, a very lame PDF viewer. Uh, actually, it's a pretty good PDF viewer, but um, you probably don't use it on Windows. Um, 
Okay, so you can see that there's a PDF there. That's, that's what people would see in Acro Read or Adobe, whatever. Um, but if we uh, load it, we can load it as well inside a LibreOffice. Instead of a PDF, you know, it says PDF at the top here, but actually it's the same ODF file that you would have been editing anyway, right? Full fidelity, everything there, and you know, you can, you can, you can do what you like with it. So, so that's pretty cool, right? Nice. Solves the interoperability problems uh, in, in quite an elegant way, I hope, mailing, mailing that data to other people. So let me get back to my slides. Ah, flat ODF. So let's also try saving this as f a flat ODF file. So um, the extensions that we use for ODF are ODT for text, ODS for spreadsheet. So the last letter means the type it is, text, spreadsheet, presentation, ODP. Um, and if you put an F in front of it, it means flat. So what does flat mean? Well, so normally our, our, the files we save in are um, bank robbery doesn't pay much. Oh, I see. You know, well, anyway, you can see what's in my... Uh, apparently, it doesn't pay much. There's a whole uh, you know, uh, paper on why bank robbers are, are poor, you know, which is probably a good thing to show your children. You know, like crime statistically doesn't pay as well as supposedly not paying and being ethically wrong. But uh, anyway, so um, we can save... Normally, we save a zip file with stuff inside it. Uh, like all of your images and things are just files inside a zip file. And, and that's all good. But it's rather difficult to see, and it's, it's more difficult to generate. So we can save as FODT. And then I will look for an Emacs or, or create another one. Mm -hmm. And you can see that inside it, really, there's a whole load of pretty printed XML here. So if we look for Hello World, you'll see that there's a text run. And it, ODF looks a bit like HTML in concept. So there's this you know, text P style name, paragraph one. And P1 is not a terribly um, descriptive style, uh, but if we went and looked at the style description above, it would say something like bold, I, I assume. And so you can see, you know, this, this little smiley guy. I don't know if you can see the draw type smiley up here um, that's been embedded. And this is very easy to generate, very easy to work with, very easy to script. If you want to check it into a revision control system, you can check it in and then you can run a diff and see what actually changed rather than getting binary files differ or, or something like that, which is, which is pretty nice, pretty nice feature. So, 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 so that's nice. Let me encourage you. And it's also fast. And um, we wrote this uh, as native code. So there's, there's, it's actually faster to load a flat ODF file if it's in memory than it is to load a zip, the zip version because you don't unzip it. And, and certainly saving it, you don't have to zip it, uh, which takes some time. So depending how big the file is, uh, you know, it, it can be pretty quick. Images are base64 encoded, so if we stick a, an image or a binary blob in it, uh, that will be preserved. And it's a, it's a really nice, a nice format for people to uh, play with and generate uh, you know, attractive reports and stuff. Gosh, I'm doing a lot. Um, OK, perfect. So that's nearly the end of my talk. But this is my conclusion. So LibreOffice, it's growing. We're doing a whole lot of funky stuff. We're executing. We're making this, this vision of, uh, of a decent office suite that's free software and is something we're proud of actually happen. Um, developers uh, now find it, should find it very easy to get involved in LibreOffice. Some places are easier in the code than others, but uh, we, we're, we're making it easier. Um, I'm just admiring the Microsoft advert for Microsoft Office, you know, making it easier for students and so on, just while I'm here. Um, we're getting a lot better for users too. The feature depth is improving, and you know there's loads of corporate support and lots of progress going on there. It's it's pretty nice. We have lots we want to do. You know, there's a whole load of work in collaboration. It's a whole load of work on mobile platforms, Android and iOS and so on. Um, there's just tons that needs doing. We we would love to have your help to do that. If you are a programmer that raised your hand earlier, we have fun things that you can do. You know, everyone is valued in the project, and we'd love to uh, love to have you involved. The final thing is just saying thanks, really. I mean, loads of people have helped make LibreOffice what it is, supported us, uh, used the software, told their friends that there's a new brand in town, and uh, you know, it may be pronounced, uh, uh, you may have a different brand lodged in your head, but LibreOffice is where it is at. Uh, so thank you for that. And yeah, please do get involved and uh, help get people excited about free software. So thank you for your time. You've been very good. Any questions? Hi, there is any question? Aha, there's a man down here. I give for that. Yeah, um, right. Hello. 
Can I speak now? <laughs> Hello. Um, yeah, the question that I've got is, I'm just wondering if it's actually possible to edit a, let's say, a document mm -hmm. in on an Android platform. Like, so if I've got a Galaxy S3, for example, mm -hmm. uh, is, is there anything that allows me to edit at all? Yeah, sure. So actually, uh, I didn't show you our editing... Um, editing demo. I, I will try and launch it for you. Last time I did, it crashed. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, this is some kind of snapshot of the latest, okay, right, uh, the latest uh, stuff. But the punchline is, yes, actually the editing is not, um, not horribly difficult to do. And so we have a prototype there. It's a matter of taking that through, you know, making it more usable, more robust, getting it in the App Store. And Previously, we had a size limit problem because it's quite big. It's like 150 megabytes at the moment. Well, no, 100 megabytes. It's about 100 megabytes, but there was a 50 meg limit. And so, yeah, so we're doing some work to shrink that down, but we'd love help. If you want to get involved typing on code, submitting patches, you know, debugging and so on, that would be much appreciated. Um, a lot of the heavy lifting is done, but yeah, as of today, you won't be able to uh, get it on your Galaxy. Yeah. But we're, we're getting there, you know. Uh, yeah, I was wondering with collaboration and that sort of thing. Sure. How much is there that an undergrad computer scientist could actually add? Is awesome. A, or is it all? Hard oh, I love to hear this kind of question. This is a brilliant kind of question. Undergrad computer scientists are much loved in LibreOffice. Uh, I don't know if you saw the Google Summer of Code stuff. Are you are you aware of the Google Summer of Code program? Awesome. So you should be on it. You know, I mean, it's a. Uh, or maybe you can get better money elsewhere. I I, I don't know, but it, it's it's a pretty cool program where students are paid by Google to work on free software projects in their holidays. And we have, in, had, in the past, we've had more mentors than people applying. So we've only taken 10 students, and we could have taken 20 easily if there were more good students applying. So your question was specifically about collaboration. So uh, collaboration is an interesting and a hard problem. I have some slides about it somewhere else. But our basic approach is, is to try and simplify the space. So uh, as soon as you start talking collaboration, people go composable operations, abstract redesign, everything in the core uh, stuff, right? But at the end of the day, if you're spending a whole lot of time to try and resolve conflicts and so on, whereas in reality, conflicts happen really very, rather infrequently, and if you train the users even less frequently, um, I think we can do some very good collaborative editing without huge heavy lifting problems. So. So one approach is to abandon undo redo. So that's your first first take. Get rid of undo redo because it's difficult, and then simply undo every operation as soon as it's done. So you know this is not a terribly difficult step. So you type something in the document, it's immediately undone. And what you do is that whilst people are changing things, you try and record what is happening to the core of the document model, but you can only see a subset of that. So you can't solve the problem immediately but you can see a subset of the changes that happen. And everything else is undone anyway, right? So then instead of applying those, those, you send them to a server and you apply whatever comes back to the server. So everyone is applying the same, same commands coming from the server, so everyone should be consistent, right? So that is the approach we've, we are planning. Uh, we have a prototype in Calc, which I had compiled, but uh, I, I think is unlikely to, uh, unlikely to work, but I, I can try. It's possible even that... Um, if, if we run something really risky, I don't know. No, no, it's not having a good day over there. Um, <laughs> come and see me afterwards, and I'll try and get the demo working. But yeah, there's a lot of fertile work to be done there that would be awesome. I mean, you know, it's um, a fantastic feature to, to have. So see me at the end. Yeah? Any Perfect. other question? No? Other questions? How are we doing for time? Are we, am, I, am I over running? If uh, there is not a question, I would like to ask one. Oh, go for it. Maybe yeah, yeah. it's a kind of tricky question, but uh, what is the actual relation between OpenStack, uh, sorry, between uh, OpenOffice and LibreOffice? Yeah, I don't know that I really want to uh, talk about that, actually. You know, I, I'll talk about LibreOffice and, and how good it is. Let me tell you a few things that are good about LibreOffice. Uh, so, you know, we're extremely diverse. We have contributors all over the space. Uh, you know, that there are a vast number of people from individuals uh, are by far the largest proportion of our contributors. Uh, you know, we are supported, uh, the entity that does all the release and engineering and manages the project and, in, you know, provides the builds and so on 
is a, a German Stiftung, a foundation in Germany with you know uh, strong uh, backing and financial assets. We're supported primarily by donations at that level. So, you know, all of the core infrastructure is 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 funded by people who give because they love the project, right? You know, in, in small donations like ten bucks, you know, a, a throw when they download. So that's, you know, so we're encouraged by that. That's great. You know, our downloads are growing pretty heavily. You know, we have, and I, I forget the numbers uh, here, but something like, no, oh, I'm going to make it up. Nearly 50 million downloads since we since we started. And of course, that doesn't include the uh, Linux people. So maybe there are 30 million Linux uh, Linux people out there. So, you know, this is very encouraging for us. Uh, you know, companies are supporting LibreOffice. You know, from Intel to AMD to Google to SUSE to Red Hat. You know, all, all across the spectrum. Every Linux vendor that I'm aware of is shipping uh, LibreOffice with part of their product. You know, we're doing, we're doing pretty well. So, you know, we're, we're really focused on the future, which is where we think it is, uh, on making it easy for developers and building an environment where it's pleasant to contribute. You know, we have a can-do attitude. We want people to get involved. Uh, we love them to contribute, and we try and make that easy and, and, and draw them in and make it a fun, organic uh, place to be. So, you know, while I have a co corporate hat on, I'm now working for Calabra. Uh, you know, hopefully we keep that uh, relatively uh, low. Uh, my friend here, Tim, is at Lanido, also working on the LibreOffice in the back. And we all collaborate around this, this core pool of code, which is copyleft license. So we believe that in general, uh, you know, the, the free software is, is important and that the right to proprietize is much less important than the responsibility to contribute back. And so our, our license reflects that if you get involved with LibreOffice, you are re expected uh, and required to contribute your changes to the core back as public. Now, of course, you can do proprietary things around the edge. You can write proprietary connectors, blah, 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 all of that stuff. But we expect people to compete with each other on service and support and you know, exotic new applications of LibreOffice and all that kind of thing. But we don't expect people to compete by not contributing their code back. That's something that's not acceptable in, in our view. So. Can you explain how the people can download and install LibreOffice? Sure, that's, that's really easy. So uh, you see the brand, it's at the top, top left, LibreOffice. Just type that into your web browser, uh, and, uh, or put a .org on the end, and you'll find, uh, find LibreOffice. Uh, you know, a couple of clicks and you'll have downloaded it. Um, go for it, it's free. As I say, it runs on Windows, Mac, uh, Linux of any kind. And yeah, we'd love, love people to use it, so do, give it a try, and get involved improving and uh, making it better. Any other questions? <laughs> Thank you, Michael, for your inspiring talk on LibreOffice. <laughs> Thank you very much. Round of applause Thank for, you for Michael Meeks. You are very good. And um, next up, we'll have Karen Alzari. So that'll be in the next 10 minutes. So stay tuned. <laughs> 